so thanks for joining me um, on Valentine's Day, nonetheless. Um, looking at um, you know what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, creating experience principles for UX systems. Um, I was thinking about when putting this together, um, you know, focusing on this for a few reasons. I think I've right now I work in consulting and um, I've worked in um, client side for for nearly a decade as well and and kind of going through that process um, you know I've kind of seen different phases of of a UX system and um, and in consulting lately um, you know I've ended up in a position of working with clients and, and setting up design systems um, so I want to talk a little bit uh, more about that and I think um, to do that um, it's important to, to kind of realize that um, this isn't necessarily a new idea, um, the idea of, of UX systems and design. I think um, just looking through, um, you know, history and, and looking at the way that design systems have been used, um, you know, government organizations have used design systems um, across uh, different touch points and, and in different ways. Um, Cities have used design systems. So looking at, um, you know, New York City and Vignelli, and there's a lot of uh, great examples of, of really strong design systems to um, use in wayfinding and graphic systems and um, signage. And there's, there's a lot of really great examples in history of, of systems and the way they've been used in the past. Um, and I think even, uh, you know, when it comes down to um, using them these days, um, they're used in, in a digital way. But I think if you look back across um, history, you've seen them used in, in a lot of different cases. Um, you know, even corporations, uh, you, you have uh, companies like Braun, um, industrial design companies where, you, where systems are really used for, um, you know, industrial design and also graphic design and kind of identifying patterns across um, different different types of products and um, different communication uh, touch points. So just a little um, highlight there on, on the way that um, different systems have been used um, in the past. And I think it's just to sort of say that we've got, um, we've come a long way in the way that we've used things and there's a long lineage of this. Um, I think it's a really timeless idea and it's really powerful and I think it's gotten a lot of attention uh, more recently um, for lots of different reasons. And I think uh, Google's material design is a, is a great example of, um, you know, it being used in a, UX systems being used in a really powerful uh, way digitally. Um, it was obviously really influential and kind of launched this new, this new breed of, of attention on on um, design systems and how they relate to UX. I think um, there's plenty of other examples of this. Um, Airbnb, of course. Um, IBM has a great um, has great documentation around this. Uh, every every company that you can think of generally has some form of a design system that they're using, um, whether it's explicit or or more implicit. But um, and across industries, fashion. Uh, print design obviously still still very much using um, design systems and um, cities are still using design systems and you're still seeing this in the physical world. So I think um, what I wanted to focus on today was really um, more about like what doesn't change. So uh, there's this this quote from Jeff Bezos about um, I very frequently get the question what's going to change in the next 10 years. I almost never get the question what's not going to change in the next 10 years. And I submit to you that that second question is actually the more important of the two. Um, and I actually really think that that, um, that says a lot about, about um, what I'm gonna focus on today, which is really about the things that don't change. And there's this, there's this other quote relating to the way that um, humans work together. Um, that I that I found on Twitter actually when I was when I was thinking about this talk and um, it's from Lloyd Voss and the older I get the more every problem in tech seems to be a matter of getting humans to work together effectively and not the tech itself 
Um, so I really want to focus in on that today um, and, and talk a little bit about experience principles. Um, and so first kind of defining what that means. Uh, so experience principles outline the core values of a product or a service. Um, they answer the, the question, how can we assure the product's purpose is expressed through design? And so here's a, here's a really quick example of that in the real world. So Spotify, for instance, has um, a great set of principles. Uh, so content first, be alive, get familiar, do less, stay authentic, and legom, um, which is actually Swedish for uh, just enough. Um, and this really says a lot about um, the way that they, they actualize product and the way they think about product um, in, in terms of thinking about content and personalization, um, in terms of thinking about um, not over-engineering and, and kind of being uh, very intentional about what they're putting forward. And I think you see this expressed in their product and, and they have a great set of, of principles um, that, that help guide them. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, written about um, the way they use principles online. So there's, there's plenty to dig into there. Um, I think every company sort of does this a different way. Um, but just highlighting this, this here with Spotify. And then I want to talk about a little bit about who helps define them. Um, I think with working in, uh, you know, on the client side and in consulting, um, it, it, it tends to vary and it tends to vary based on the programs that you're working on or um, the size of the company. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors and, and really where the input comes, comes from. Um, but generally, there's, there's sort of a main stakeholder, and there's a lot of other uh, influences um, when you're kind of putting together these principles. I think um, there's usually sort of a, a more global marketing um, agenda and, and team to tap into. Um, there's a product marketing team. Um, there may be existing brand strategy documents or UX strategy documents. Um, there's lots of, of different inputs here depending on on what you're working on and the size of the company that you're working with or the organization and what you're trying to achieve. But these are really uh, tend to be like key sources of input when thinking about these principles. So um, how do you generate them? I think um, there's lots of ways, obviously. I think one way I wanted to talk about um, today was workshops and um, just a really quick method that I've used in the past to, to define experience principles. Um, and generally what happens is you know, people, brands kind of have their own um, baked in sort of brand footprint and, and positioning, and you can um, pretty easily get to that, whether it's in their, uh, you know, brand guidelines or, or wherever that is. Um, but I think uh, when you, when you kind of go from, from marketing to product, you start to realize that um, how do you kind of make those things actionable? So you kind of need to start unpacking some of those uh, principles or, or those brand positioning statements. So something like empowering, for instance, um, means a very different thing to a company like Nike or an organization like Greenpeace or Wikipedia. Um, and I think that's really part of, part of the process I'll talk about today. Um, I think, you know, thinking about how you might um, start to uh, generate these, you can you can always lean on a workshop to, to sort of get a group together and really um, hash out and, and sort of anchor on some points. Um, this activity here is, is really simple. Um, you know, a group of two to 10 people, uh, kind of a smaller group, um, takes maybe an hour to an hour and a half, is really um, not very complicated and requires very little um, in terms of materials, but um, it would go something like this. So, you write down your three existing core brand attributes on a whiteboard, and that would come from, like I said, those sources of input, whether it's the client stakeholders or it's the existing documentation, brand positioning, things like that. Um, and as a group, you just spend at least 30 minutes creating a word cloud for the initial three to five words. Um, you can use a thesaurus when you're stuck. Uh, feel free to annotate words with sentences and, and give it more definition. And you're basically just creating a big word cloud. And then when the group's finished, um, we go around and ask individuals to explain what they were thinking and rationalize the group and then document that all on the whiteboard and um, use that as a way to, 
as a starting point for some of these experience principles. Um, in terms of, of defining success, you know, what, what makes good experience principles? I think they need to be really specific. Um, and this is coming from um, Ala uh, Kolmatova, which is, is a really great um, book actually that this is coming from um, on design systems. And I think experience principles that are specific, uh, experience principles that are actionable, um, that they're impressionable and, and memorable, um, and that they have a point of view and that they're living. Um, and that means that they, they, they're, they have the ability to change based on um, what you're trying to solve for. So I think digging into that a little bit deeper, what I mean by when they're specific, so a really bad example of that is um, when, you know, clients generally say, um, you know, we want this to be simple, we want this to be enjoyable, we want this to be useful. Um, those are really, you know, um, sort of common, um, very obvious uh, statements that um, are made about, about sort of vision, visionary uh, ways that people want to approach experience principles. Um, but a really good example of, of that would be something um, uh, referencing that, that Spotify uh, example from earlier. So like Legom is something that is, ties directly back to their heritage as a Swedish company. And then also um, this idea of content first, um, it sort of puts the priority on, on something. So when you're making a design decision, you can, you can use this to kind of guide your decision. Um, and then the idea of do less, so there's, there's ways to get a little bit more um, granular and, and targeted when you're talking about design systems and um, experience principles. Making them actionable, I think a bad example of this is like make it clear. Um, a good example of this is, is only, number, only one number one priority. So thinking about um, how, do you, how do you make a decision about a design and how do you um, use these principles to inform that decision. Um, so this is just a way to kind of really get targeted when you're, when you're trying to um, make a decision like that. And then I think something like, we really need to focus on them being memorable. And I think um, that comes from whether it's, um, you know, making them between three and five words, acronyms really help, um, displaying them in team rooms and, and design critiques. These all are great ways to to kind of make these um, experience principles memorable. They have a point of view. So I think thinking about tension points and um, not simply putting a positive against a negative. So, um, you know, when you're thinking about something like um, touch points across a system and you're thinking about mobile and um, you're thinking about um, tablet and you're thinking about how do you, how do you make a decision on when to be consistent over appropriate, um, I think this is a really good example of, of when you can let experience principles guide you. And they're living, I think that's just to say that um, they're not static and they can evolve based on new discovery, tension points, et cetera. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, getting a little bit more specific about uh, the tactical nature of experience principles and some of my experience. So I think it's really important that um, you have this underlying system that defines a unified experience and the artifact of this thinking typically defines interaction patterns, behaviors, pattern, reusable components, color, typography, et cetera. So um, really the artifact of experience principles a lot of times ends up being a DLS or a design language system. So I'll just talk a little bit about how um, a DLS um, is used in a typical design program. So looking at um, when, you, when you kick off a project, you're usually tackling a lot of different areas um, across an experience and you have you know, various streams of work going on and you generally have a centralized design team, a DLS team that's, that's um, acting sort of as a gatekeeper and, and bringing in um, all of these components and hashing out all of these different uh, behaviors and, and documenting them and then of course, as you, as you go closer to completion of project, you're, you're looking at that DL, DLS team getting a lot smarter in terms of um, patterns that they're using. They're able to start kicking those things out to, to the experience tracks. And um, there's a lot of efficiency gains when you, when you get to that point and you're really just um, not re reinventing the wheel and really 
focusing in on um, the experience and less on um, creating new patterns and things like that. So um, this is a little high level view of, of how um, design language systems generally operate in, in a design program. And these are useful tools. I think this is, again, trying to get a little bit more tactical on um, tools that, that I've used. I think Sketch is an obvious one. Um, Craft is a great one for just syncing across libraries and things like that. Um, UX pen um, to prototype. And obviously, um, you know, I haven't really focused on a lot on tools here um, intentionally. And, and these are just, this is just a quick list because these are always changing, I think. And it's really not so much about tools um, when I think about design systems and experience principles. So um, it's really more about that idea of um, what doesn't change. And tools are constantly changing and there's lots out there to explore. Um, I think there's a few a few points here in terms of a DLS. Um, I think being really consistent is important. Um, removing redundancy, um, design for team input, syncing and distribution, um, designing for that at a, at a first glance understanding, and then uh, making the team smarter. So like I said, I think looking at um, how you sort of gain efficiencies as you go through a project, or um, if you're working inside of a company as that company um, pivots to different directions and you're, you're sort of building that design language, um, how do you start to make gain efficiencies as you, as you build up a design system? And then this is an interesting example um, that Airbnb showcased um, a few months ago, and it's an internal tool uh, that really is, is really kind of fascinating, and I think it just speaks to, to where we're going in terms of tools just constantly changing, and we don't really have a um, we don't really know what's next, but we, we know there's a lot of things to focus on in terms of, um, you know, experience and what doesn't change. So in this example, you're seeing a designer sketch something on the right and um, it's being directly translated into code. And this is actually really powerful. I remember when I first saw this, I was like, this is kind of scary uh, for designers. But at the same time, there's a lot of efficiencies we gain and a lot of ways that we can refocus on on the overall experience if we if we shift away from thinking so much about tools so thank you Justin can you hear me okay yes i can hear you okay Awesome. Um, thank you for um, the talk. That's been very insightful. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. We are open up for Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, please drop it in the Q&A box um, down below. And then we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, of course, all of the, the slides um, and the sessions are recorded and we will have them uploaded online. Um, we're aiming for the end of the week. Um, so please check back with us um, on that. We'll, we'll try to have them uploaded as soon as possible. All right, so first question. Um, did you find it difficult to gain wide adoption of the design system in the company? Um, design systems in general, I think, I think it depends on the scale of the company. Um, I think what's generally good is if you, if you have a process in place. Um, and so I think it's easy to sort of publish things and, and document things and, um, have a system that's very clear to designers and, and maybe even just a few designers. I think what's difficult is when you go to um, scaling to different, to larger companies and how do you sort of uh, maintain that balance of consistency over um, enforcement, if that makes sense. So I think there's this, you, you need to allow for enough um, room in the system to, um, to build and, and innovate so it shouldn't restrict solutions and I think that's a really tricky balance. I think um, I think Google's material design does a really good job of that, of just creating a baseline behavior metaphor 
without restricting people into, into these exact patterns that they're stuck with. And so you see this consistency across, but it's not homogenous. Um, so there, so there, I think there is a little bit of a challenge with adoption. I think it comes from the tension of, of creating a baseline versus trying to be too restrictive and then also with process and, and how you kind of build process into a company culture. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, next question is, um, how do you sway your managers who are not UX friendly, um, but yet wants you to have all the knowledge and expertise like we do and, and implement that into convincing them to use UX pen? I think, I mean, in terms of convincing and persuading people, I mean, I think research, I, because I work at a company, I work at a consultancy and, and a lot of times um, we're provided a lot of research and we do a lot of research. Uh, we're, we're a research driven company. So I think in a way we, we're sort of armed with research and it's, it's easy to go there first. Um, to have sort of evidence-based design is a really good strategy. I think the other way I do that when there isn't a lot of research is I look for best in class examples or I look for um, sort of adjacent examples in the, the space that I'm, I'm designing in. Um, so I think that's, those are a few, few ways that I've dealt with that um, difficult task because it is, it is a difficult one because we kind of, even when we know what's right, it's like, how do we, how do we guide and, and influence clients and managers? Awesome. Thank you. Um, another user noticed that you use experience principles instead of slightly more commonly used design principles. What do you see is the difference here? Yeah, that's a really good example. Um, a really good question. I think I kind of see that as um, design principles can sometimes be really specific to um, sort of an artifact or a touch point, um, not always, but it, but it can be. Where I kind of think is experience principles is how you experience a product or a service or anything really. So I think there's, there's a little bit of a intentional nomenclature shift there where I'm really talking more about um, that experience and less about that actual product. So it's not the design principles of you know, the industrial design of this product. Um, it's more about how you use that, that product and, and what that feels like and what that should feel like and what sort of the more general philosophy should be. But they're used synonymously a lot for sure. And it's not, um, you know, I think that's just a common, common case of those two things are used synonymously. Okay. Um, next question. Um, do you think experience principles can be or should be linked to brand principles? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's actually kind of what I was trying to get at with um, some of the workshop activities that I mentioned. I think because we really always, I always notice that, um, you know, you generally always have some form of, of brand principles because <clears throat> usually a company always has some some form of marketing and some, some anchor that they align on in terms of marketing and communications and things like that. I think um, those are really great because they really speak to like the messaging generally and, and what this thing should sometimes feel like. Um, but what they, they don't always do is they're not always as actionable um, when it comes down to making design decisions um, when you're building something or designing an actual uh, product or experience. So, um, so yeah, I generally think they're really helpful. Um, and, but I generally think, and I think they're very connected. Awesome. Okay. So the next question is more, um, it's kind of related to your process. Um, could you talk more about, um, the journey that you are on with tools that you use? For, scare, uh, for sharing sketch libraries to your designs? Yeah, um, more recently, like we've used, I think it was about two years ago when I started using craft 
to sync across with sketch. I think sketch is, sketch is even new in a way um, because I've spent most of my career working in Adobe products. Um, so using sketch as a tool has been definitely um, a big deal over the past couple of years. And then I think craft came along as a way to sync across um, libraries and you can do that via the cloud in different ways. But I think, and then there's prototyping of course, which, which gets into, um, you know, UX pen has some great prototyping tools. They've used some UX pen tools. Um, there's, there's lots of different, different tools based on what you're trying to accomplish, but those are some general ones I've used. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, and I think um, we've been getting a lot of this question um, and our users are wanting to know how do you measure the success of systems, adoption, engagement, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I think adoption and engagement is one, one metric and obviously important. I think the other one is actually like efficiency gains, like, and, and not just, not just tactically like who's adopting it and who's engaging it, but, but also like efficiency gains and, and is it making the team quicker and are they designing better because of it? And I guess what I mean by that is um, we, we sort of as designers can sometimes attack every problem as its own little problem and sort of try to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then we kind of zoom in on, on these like individual problems and create these great little things. Um, but if you zoom out a little bit and you focus more on this overarching experience that you're trying to create and, and a lot of these things are solved for you, you can sort of solve bigger problems. Um, so I think in that way, I think it's really for me about efficiency gains that lead to thinking and solving bigger problems. Um, I think the adoption and, and all of that is, is really important if you're working in if you're making sort of a shift away from a previously designed system or lack of system into like something that's really cohesive, I think that's, that's really great. But I think the next level of that is really elevating it to, to make, make you smarter and kind of solve bigger problems because it's really efficient. Okay, awesome. And I know um, a lot of users here, um, they're interested in knowing, um, do you have any suggestions for other resources for learning about getting started on design systems? Yeah, the, um, the book I mentioned in my talk, I, th I thought was really helpful. Um, and it'll be in my deck for reference, but it's, that's a really good book. Um, I think it's called Designing systems actually and it's it's in my it'll be in my talk but that one i i really think does a really good job of summing up kind of where we're at right now with design systems and and really being a little bit more actionable and and um it kind of balances like the academic with the more practical and i really like that that approach um i think other than that i mean i think there's just a ton out there on the internet now in terms of um you know just digging around medium and and different um, UX pin obviously and different articles that you can find. Um, I think most design companies, or I shouldn't say most design companies, a lot of companies that do design really well, so Airbnb or um, Google, et cetera, all have uh, design specific blogs. So they have, their design departments actually have blogs where they, they uh, post to. And I, and I find those really useful because um, there's a lot of smart designers working there and you can you can sort of uh, learn learn how different organizations are tackling different problems and i think that's really cool thank you um next question uh aside from unpacking your brand um what else would you suggest as a how-to yeah um I think it's really helpful and I, it's kind of, it was, it was brought up in the process of how I think about experience principles, but I think it's really helpful to start with what's already out there. And a lot of times everything you need is already out there, whether it's the, 
brand footprint documentation or whether it's um, you know talking to stakeholders who kind of know the company well. Um, so I actually think like research and talking to people as a tool to to sort of gain understanding and whether it's your stakeholders or whoever it is that you're working with um, and interviewing them and trying to figure out like what it is that that what their vision is for for the company or for the product that you're building um, that that's always a really good way to to sort of um, and, and that's more of an ad hoc way you know it, it doesn't have to be workshops all the time um, but I but I do think that's always a really good way to start okay and what roles does culture play in creating design principles um, how would you use it or try to um, mitigate that? Um, I think <clears throat> I, I think that question is referring probably to to culture as in like culture inside of companies and not culture in terms of um, so so I'll answer it in in that way. I think culture inside of companies is is I think what's what I've noticed about working at different companies and working with different companies is there generally are, 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 are sort of ways of behavior that are completely different depending on, on um, the company. So whether it's like decentralized management or, or really centralized management or, um, you know, this small startup -y, uh, mentality or this large, um, large company mentality. So there's different ways to think about culture and different sort of metrics and, and, axes to look at that um, and so I think dealing with that is is always really contextually dependent on on who you're talking to and what you're operating in I think it's really difficult to um, scale things inside of a large company no matter what you're doing um, whether it's design or anything else it seems just it I think it kind of speaks back to what I was talking about in my presentation around um, it's a lot of the problems with, with, you know, technology isn't the technology, but it's, it's kind of the humans around it. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really important point. And I think it's really difficult, the larger the company you get to deal with this problem. Okay. Awesome. What about smaller um, design teams? Do you have any recommendations for um, how to implement a design system? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think if you have a smaller product or something that, that isn't as complex, which would, um, when I think about a smaller design team, it's usually because you have a smaller product. Um, and I think in that case, you don't always need this sort of, this sort of team managing a, a centralized uh, design system. And you generally kind of all work off of one thing that's shared. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of answering that question, I mean, I don't know exactly what, um, how to answer that if it's like a technology question or, or just how do you sort of work together. Um, so I'm not sure how to answer that one beyond, beyond that. Okay, thank you, Dustin. Um, we um, will have one more question here. Um, as an agency delivering a design system, how is testing performed and how do you make sure that the integrity of the system is upheld after the handoff? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, um, so testing, it really depends on the client um, and you're asking specifically as an agency. I think, um, you know, I've done it a few ways. I think one way is, um, you know, working with, with larger clients, they may have a team of, of um, UX researchers and we'll have, um, you know, questions that we want to ask and um, they'll help us set, um, set up those, those interviews and set up those, um, uh, those recruitments. And then we'll, of course, be there with them alongside them and, and um, listening in and, and kind of 
uh, help guide that research. And then we take that back and, and we tackle it just the, the same way that they would. Um, and then there's other instances where we've been completely out of the loop when it comes to, to testing and research. Um, so I'm not sure if that, if that answers your question, but I think there's, there's kind of different, different engagements and different ways that we, that we would deal with um, testing. And, and in terms of handoffs, I think um, handoffs can be really tricky, I think, on the agency side, depending on, on what you're working on. I think generally we work on really long engagements and we'll, we'll kind of see things um, pretty through to, to delivery, but sometimes we were in an engagement where we're just working on like the vision um, and we're just working on setting up sort of a vision for a project and we're not actually um, worried about how this thing ends up as a product. So it kind of depends on the engagement um, and, and what the handoff is. And sometimes the handoff is just, you know, uh, a slide deck that will kind of talk to, to where we think this should go and then we won't see it again. Or sometimes we're like really involved all the way up to the end and we're working with developers and doing QA testing. And, and so that really depends on the engagement, I think. Awesome. Thank you. Um, that was very insightful. Um, <clears throat> again, thank you, Dustin, um, for your time. Um, and we're also glad that everyone is able to join today. Um, tomorrow, we do have another webinar uh, coming up. So we would love to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.